The rate of diabetes advancements these days has really been through the roof. You got new technologies, new medications, new screening options. It can be hard to keep up. The good news is we just got back from the ATTD Diabetes Technology Meeting in Amsterdam. Where Jeremy was high the whole time. What do you, what do you mean? My, my blood sugars were actually pretty good last week. Not that kind of high, Jeremy. Oh. Yeah, well, well, anyway, today we're gonna highlight some of the most important updates and takeaways from the conference. I'm Dr. Steve Edelman. I'm Dr. Jeremy Pettis. And we are taking control of your diabetes. All right, so we're gonna summarize for you in a couple minutes, four days worth of this meeting. And we're gonna break it down into three major kind of categories. Technology updates, new medications, and then finishing with islet cell transplantation. So starting with this kind of interesting movement where some people are trying to say that in addition to using time and range as our CGM metric, we should now be using time and tight range a blood sugar between 70 and 140 rather than 70 and 180 as our main metric. I actually did a debate on this topic. I was on the pro time and range side and I gotta say, I really destroyed the other guy who's a great guy, but um, there's just no data to move to this time and tight range. I think it would stress patients out more. It would cause more hypoglycemia. So it's too early to make that, that shift. Yeah, and I think, I think it's valuable if you're looking at how well these hybrid closed loop systems work, you know, looking at big data and how, how, how much time that people can get into a really tight range, but not for the, us users out there. We got enough stress trying to get between 70 and 180. So what about in continuous ketone monitoring, Steve, tell us about that. Yeah, that's, it's a whole new area that's coming here and now at the end of this year or early next year, Abbott makes a continuous glucose monitor, as you all know, the Libre line, but they are now gonna come out with a continuous ketone monitor that measures both glucose and ketones. It'll be a 14 day wear, one sensor, and I think um, it'll be very valuable in picking up DKA as it starts long before someone gets symptoms. And it's, you know, you don't need to know your ketones all the time. It'll display your glucose and only alert you when your ketones get into like a problematic area. A lot of education needs to happen on what are normal ketone values? When should people be alerted? How do we feel these calls when people call into the clinic? That kind of stuff. I'm going to send them to you. Thank you. But you know what? We don't know what normal ketone levels are in people with diabetes, type 1 and type 2. So... The bottom line is we're gonna learn a ton mm -hmm. from having this ability to measure continuous ketone levels. All right, so then what about just these hybrid closed loop systems? You know, the Omnipod 5s, the Tandems, Medtronics. What were the, some of the kind of the big takeaways there? Yeah, well, I can tell you there was a ton of data on these hybrid closed loop systems in all kinds of settings in type two diabetes, big time, during pregnancy, menstrual periods, preschool kids, elderly individuals, and they all showed the same thing. Better A1C or GMI, better metrics, less hypoglycemia, improved quality of life. So in that area, there wasn't anything tremendously new, just more data to support the value of these hybrid closed loop systems. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that was interesting, a lot of these companies now are trying to get away from having the patient have to input carbs or announce a meal. And it shows that they can get the time and range up to about 68, 69% with no input from the patient. Just let the algorithm take over. But then there was one short, uh, small study that looked at bihormonal. So they had insulin to really be aggressive, but they had glucagon to prevent hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. And the time and range was 79%. So we can get another Without 10... Without having to announce meals or anything like that. That's right. So really moving to these fully closed loop systems. Yeah, and glucagon allows you to put pedal to the metal with insulin and avoid hypoglycemia. So that is coming and that was exciting to me. Yeah, so you know we always talk about hybrid closed loop, but the ideal would be to drop that H, get rid of hybrid, <laughs> yeah. and it becomes just a closed loop where us type ones don't have to do ideally anything, and these systems can just do a good job of keeping us in range. All right, so that's kind of technology very quickly. Um, in new therapies, um, we've talked about t yield a lot, that it's approved to delay the onset of type 1 diabetes. Now there's this major kind of development where they did test it in newly diagnosed people to see if it could help preserve C-peptide or insulin production 
once people are already diagnosed. And in this recently published study, it worked in terms of it showed that it did help um, you know, preserve insulin production. And some of the new data that was released at this conference was, in addition to C-peptide, there was actually an improvement in time and range and some of these clinical outcomes. So we think it's very likely that relatively soon, this will be approved for newly diagnosed type 1s, which would be amazing because you don't have to screen those people. It's very easy to kind of find somebody when they're newly diagnosed with type 1 and offer them this new therapy. Yeah, we, we don't look for them. They, they find us. Right. What could I do to reverse my kid's diabetes or my diabetes? It'll be a big deal. Yeah. And it was called the PROTECT study. So you know what? It's all uh, in the FDA's hand now, and they have to decide if they're going to approve it and what kind of limitations it'll, it'll have. So then the last thing was just kind of in cellular therapies. And the company called Vertex has been kind of leading the charge here. And no major updates other than they're getting very close to kind of completing these initial studies where they take uh, islet cells that are derived from stem cells, infuse them into patients where they kind of take up in the liver. And people generally do very well with this therapy. What do you want to say about that? Well, you know, they're, they're getting close to completion. And that means it, the possibility of having a cell, cellular therapy in the near future is real. Mm. And the individuals at this point need to have problems with hypoglycemia, more like severe hypoglycemia. And you have to take low dose immunosuppressants, not the same dose you would need if you had a kidney transplant or a pancreas transplant. So lower, but still you need to take those. Yeah. And so that is really coming very soon. So that's kind of our recap very quickly of these broad categories, but hopefully you get the idea that all of these categories are advancing forward very quickly. We just saved you four days of going to Amsterdam <laughs> yeah. and following Jeremy around the different coffee shops. Mm -hmm. So we want to hear from you. Please let us know in the comments if something we said really jumped out to you, you're excited about, you're anxious to try. And just a reminder that there really is so much going on, Steve. It's tough to keep up with it, but that's what we're here for. That's what we love doing, giving you these updates on technology, new drugs, new therapies. It's really an exciting time. You know what? It's awesome. Check out our website for videos on all these topics. We have the podcast and the newsletter as well. We've covered them all. Yeah. And make sure to like, follow, subscribe, all the social media stuff, and we'll see you on the next video.